Boy, that's some pretty lousy intro music right there. Uh, I couldn't even hear it. Oh, hopefully nobody else did. Oh, it was it was terribly it was, lousy. It was really really lousy. Oh, hey John, we're back. Another week of no driving gloves. Yes, it is. All right. Yeah, we're trying to give a minute or two for some of the viewers to jump in because we're not doing this intro right now. I'm kind of uh, still in that dilemma of doing the intro or not, because anytime we seem to add an intro with any sort of music, it gets flag. Somebody tries to flag it as a um, copyright violation, even though I have the rights to the music we're playing, but that's kind of the new scam for streamers is um, we put out stuff and there's bots that just, as soon as they see a stream go up, they claim copyright on the music and stuff and, you know what would be fun? I don't. I, I guess you'd probably wind up wasting a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But if if we had some of our friends that we know that are musicians record an original piece of music for the show, copyright it, do everything we need to, and then use it, have one of these bots attack us as though it's copyright. And then we could go after them and counter sue and have some fun with it. Now, honestly, you can't because they're really not people. And still, they're going to claim copyright. And then we still have to go jump through hoops. That's what I'm saying. We'd and, waste and, some money, but it'd be kind of fun. And this, this, about show, principle. this show, you know, we only broadcast to two channels on Facebook and one YouTube channel. Uh, one of the other podcasts I do, we broadcast to 10 different Facebook pages. And that means I, every time somebody files one of those violations, I have to go and jump through hoop after hoop after hoop after hoop 10 times to just even have a chance at maybe proving that I have rights to the music and it's just not worth it. So we just don't suffer with music now. At some All point, right. at some point, one of these big companies, I mean, we use a pretty decent company here to stream the show. And even when I use their default stuff that I'm perfectly licensed to, and they're publishing this, the show for me to whatever social media, it still gets flagged with copyright. And they've got it, you know, basically, I think it's up to these streaming services to <clears throat> figure out how to, if it's copyrighted and it's coming through our stream to your social media, it's legit, but that's a whole nother thing. That's not talking about cars. You know, back when we had classic and vintage and antique and whatever, we didn't have yep, any they, of these streaming problems. They had radios in them that played music. So we're kind of on a theme. <clears throat> yeah, some of them did. Mm -hmm. Oh, let's see. The first radios started being installed in automobiles in the mid to late 1920s. Mm -hmm. Useless fact of the night. That's not necessarily. I'm going to add that as a. I'm going to add that as a segment mm -hmm. into the show. Useless fact of the night. Making that in my notes. Show notes. It's oh, it, it's it's my week to go first. And it just happened. It just going down. It, it's poured rain here in Birmingham tonight. Bro, it's tough to see. I'll be honest. I don't see well at night driving, and I try to avoid it. And when it rains, it's even worse. But I'm going down the road. Blah, 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 And I get the son of a bitch behind me with his brights on. And brights on, brights on. And what are you supposed to do? I mean, I, I'm in a 50 mile an hour zone on the you know, city streets. I slowed down to five. But the guy just keeps pedaling along behind me. You know, don't know what I'm supposed to do. I can't. You know, it just, it, so I guess my bitch is these, you know, people too cheap to ha buy a replacement light bulb when it, or a he headlight when it burns out, but you'll go ahead and drive around with your brights creating dangerous situations for, you know, or adding to a dangerous situation. 
little it's, do they know they're adding to a dangerous situation? But I mean, I'm blind. So, John, it's not dangerous. They're just not going to get a fix it ticket. Yeah, Even mean, though the cop will still pull them over for not dimming their lights because it's probable cause for drunk driving. But anyway. <laughs> Well, please do something like that. Now, I'll be honest. I was on my way to Taco Bell when this happened, and the idiot behind me, or the, the son bitch behind me, as Sheriff Buford T. Justice would say, um, it's one of those things that did I piss him off enough because we make the turn and he follows me on the turn and he makes the turn and follows me on the turn. I make the turn into the old Taco Bell and he makes the turn into the old Taco Bell, and I'm going, hmm, do I really want to go through the drive through And then he parks to go in the building. So <clears throat> you're right. He might have been in that um, inebriated driving. In inebriated driving, and uh, he was headed for fourth meal, you know. Yeah. Well, that's what I was kind of doing, so. Inebriated driving? You shouldn't have been. No, we the, don't promote that on the show. No, the, uh, the uh, old fourth meal, so. We just this episode brought to you by Taco Bell. And I just went in and bought the five dollar box. And you know, Brandy's asking me, So, what'd you get? Taco Bell. Well, what'd you get? I don't know. I just ordered the box and whatever comes in the bag. It's probably $5. a taco. Everything yeah, at ta then. everything at Taco Bell's the same thing. It's just kind of the thickness of the shell and how they fold it, right? Exactly. You know, so. what you know, what's a burrito? Flour tortilla with meat, cheese, toppings. What are nachos? Tortilla chip, flour tor or corn tortilla chips with meat, cheese, toppings. It's all the same, just fold it up different. Yeah, exactly. A burrito is a rolled soft taco. Uh, mm -hmm. A soft ta taco that you've deep fried is now a hard taco. <clears throat> a Mexican pizza is just flat taco shells. You know, it's just everything, you know, it's like Chick-fil-A. Everything's the same damn thing. It's just in a different shape. Exactly. Mm. Uh, chicken so. and bread, chicken and bread, chicken and bread. Yep. Oh. So, oh, gosh, all of a sudden I'm tired. Nap attack. Taco Bell, that does it to you, man. No, I, only, I barely had time to eat the first taco i don't know if it was a gordita or a chalupa it was the fat thick red shell thing without the hard taco in the middle of it so <clears throat> whatever sure that thing yeah yeah that thing so uh you know i found that when I go to edit the show for the audio, I run this thing called truncate silence. And any silence that's longer than uh, a half a second, it reduces to a half a second. And we usually save about 15 minutes a show. Wow. All right. We so, are killing it. Yeah. So we're, we're sorry, you video viewers. You, we're, we're eating up an extra 10 minutes of your life. But. I'm uh, I'm I'm kind of shocked that we haven't had any comments yet tonight. So, but maybe once we get talking about our topic here, we will get some comments. As as my uh, favorite professor that I've talked about on the show before, um, don't know if uh, <laughs> it's made it out to him that we've mentioned Professor Higby on the show, but uh, uh, you know he always liked to end class with questions, comments concerns quandaries nothing you people have nothing uh so yeah maybe we'll get some of those comments questions and quandaries as we dive into the nomenclature that is classic vintage and antique automobiles what do you think john are you up on your etymology etymology not entomology etymology of classic vintage and antique automobiles I have my opinions on it, and since they're my opinions, they must be right. I you mean, know, I heard I, a saying about opinions once. I do have, you know, I do have a podcast, so everything I say must be correct. Well, there you go. I think it went something like opinions are like belly buttons. Everybody has one. Is that how it was? I don't think everybody has a belly button. Hmm. 
All right. Well, anyway, some, some people have had them removed. I thought that was like a fashion thing. Ah, it could be. I don't know. I know they got them pierced for a while. <laughs> yeah, <sighs> it doesn't make sense to me, and I still don't know how you do that. So, I mean, it's really yeah, not I'd... pierced. I mean, you just fold the skin and stick the thing through. It's ripped. You know, ears, I, I understand, because it goes through, and then you put the thing on the back. But if you're just folding, I mean... What if you folded your earlobe and just used one ear? You, know. you better get us talking about antique vintage. Way off topic <laughs> here, John. Way off topic. Oy. Uh, all right. So seeing you've mentioned that you have your opinions, why don't you start with your opinions of classic vintage and antique automobile nomenclature or nomenclature, depending on who you are and how you pronounce it, uh, in the automotive world? It really doesn't matter because you should only drive new cars with warranties that you've leased through a major automobile manufacturer. All right. Great show, everybody. <laughs> uh, listen next week, and we may or may not have a discussion. Now, I, you know, do, do you look at it and you go with what the CCA requires, which I believe is 25 years, or what the AACA requires, which I believe is 50 years? So that would be your classic and your antique and vintage pre thirties. I don't know. And, and I don't believe in going off the license plates. You know, a lot of people have commented, well, in this state, you know, you, if it's 20 years old, you get the, this tag. If it's 25 years old, you can get this tag and so on and so on down the line. I don't think that's really it. And I, and much like, um, Many episodes ago, we talked about with, um, I don't believe it was SEMA, but one of those hot rod groups that Will shows cars at, they changed it to a rolling. You know, you couldn't have any car for the longest time, 72 or newer. It had to be 72 mm -hmm. or older. And then they changed it to 1987 and it made it a, a kind of a rolling year. So as time goes on, it keeps up with, I guess if you we were talking about that in what say two thousand, so that would have been twenty. They were going thirty five years, um, roughly. Uh, so is it thirty five years? And to me, I don't. I don't think it's a time thing. I almost look at it as cars. A classic is. kind of older and maybe something that my parents would have enjoyed. Uh, vintage, I think, starts coming. Vintage to me is older with some value. And antique is something like my grandparents or my great-grandparents might have enjoyed. And it kind of still gives it that rolling time frame and such. And if you notice, and if you go through a lot of the descriptions, and if you even go through the description of what no driving gloves is, we talk about collectible cars. And that's the term I always use, because I think it's all encompassing our collector cars. They're cars that you collect, and it doesn't define it. I don't care if your collection is 2019 Celine Mustang. It's collectible cars. I don't care if your collection is, I'm sorry, Derek, this is just popping into my head, but 2018 Chevrolet Impalas. Sweet. I mean, you, you, I've got 40 of them. It's to you, it's a collectible car. Everything can be collectible. And I, I don't, and I use that term quite often to avoid using classic vintage and antique. That's interesting because I, I actually probably would do the reverse of what you said on classic and vintage because, well, and I guess, it, you know, you mentioned, do you go by the CCCA, you know, definition or the AACA or any of the groups that are out there that like to try to define the vehicles specifically for their membership and who they're going to let in and who they're not going to let in basically is what it comes down to. 
But if you, if you use, you know, the, say if you were to apply the CC, CCCA definitions, classic would be, you know, you mentioned vintage is something that your parents would like and has some value. Whereas really kind of the way CCCA looks at it is, you know, they call them full classics and, you know, they are classic cars that are, you know, higher end and have value to them. You know, you're not talking about, you know, a Model A is not allowed in the CCCA, at least last time I checked. Um, and I doubt it is right now as a full classic. You know, so I would almost vice versa, you know, flip the two classic and vintage the way you described them, where the classic had value uh, or had a higher value than other, uh, you know, vintage cars. Thinking of the the full classic definition that CCCA would use um, for their vehicles. And, you know, antique is, is tough. And, and here's, the, you know, I think with all these, you know, I like that, you know, you commented that you use the term collectible car because it's, or collectible cars, because it is, creates basically an even playing field. It's just cars that people collect, enjoy, and have fun with. And, you know, these antique, vintage, classic, they're kind of ambiguous terms that people just use to define, you know, I think, I think it used to be at one point, uh, the antique was 75 years or older. And, uh, you know, that was kind of that definition of an antique car, but it, can you really classify it that way, way anymore? No, not really. You know, and, and I tend to, you know, I guess I tend to classify things more by their era of, of automobile. So, you know, it's pretty easy to talk about horseless carriage vehicles, brass era, nickel era, you know, black iron period, uh, you know, all of those. But then of course you get into the fifties, sixties, stuff like that, you can't really define an era. You could say, oh, my, you know, I collect 1950s cars instead of classic cars or vintage cars. Uh, but, you know, you can also, you know, you've got the muscle car era, sports car. So how do you, how do you define anything as ambiguous as classic vintage and antique? And I think that's, that's where the debate really comes in. I mean, what inspired this topic, it's one that I've thought of for a while, but I had a friend ask the question on um, social media and there's all kinds of answers, you know, 50 years old, 60 years old, 70 years old, um, what the car cost. If it's 50 plus, it's classic, 60 plus, it's vintage, 70 plus, it's antique. Um, and you, somebody else says, you know, 97 and early is a, earlier is a classic. And then, um, you get into what, again, what, like I said, what some of the various clubs, um, it's collector car insurance. Uh, I think American collectors, according to this statement, vintage car manufactured between 19 and 30 antique car manufactured 75 or early, earlier, uh, greater than 45 years old. Classic car manufactured 2000 or earlier, greater than 20 years old. Um, so with this definition, a vintage car is also an antique car and also a classic car, right? Yeah, pretty and much. So it kind of covers everything. It, um, you know, interestingly enough, I don't know that, I mean, you hear of vintage, but I feel like vintage almost isn't used that much anymore. I think it really comes down now 
I only really hear people say classic car or antique car. Very rarely do I hear the term vintage car. So that might be falling out of popularity. But I'm almost wondering if we could create new no driving glove definitions for these. And I think uh, antique car should be any car uh, that you have or collect that uh, no one is remaining living that remembers the car when it was new. I think we should start with that. That'd be an antique car. So if, if there is no one alive in the world that would have been alive when that car was new, then it's an antique. So I'm not sure who the oldest living person in the world is right now. It's usually somewhere around 110, 111 years old. So yeah, but they, the cars, they, usually, they usually live somewhere where they don't have motorized transportation. <laughs> Right, but they're still alive and they were alive when the car was new. So, you know, that's that's the way I'm going to describe it. If if you have a car that no one is alive in the world that would have been alive when that car was new, the, the year that car came out new, then you have an antique car. That's going to be my no driving gloves description of antique cars. How do you like it? Um, I don't know if I quite go with that one. I don't like you either, John. I've got the oldest person to whatever, not currently alive, but the oldest person. Uh, there we go. World's oldest man living confirmed is Juan Vicet Perez. He is 112 years and 250 days old as of February 4th. So 2022 or yeah. Yep. Yeah. So he's 112, you said? Yep. Yeah. So he'd be a hundred. He, he's pu pushing 113 now. 113. Yeah. The oldest or the living person or whatever. Well, uh, Guinness is saying the old, well, that's the oldest man. The oldest living person is Lucille Randon in France, uh, born 11 February 1904, and is 118 years old, 118 years, 73 days old, as of April 25th. So, there you I go. Guess we're looking <laughs> anything 19, 19 or four, 1904 or older is your antique car. There you go. Uh, now, I will say, uh, the way that uh, Henry Ford Museum, uh, sorry, I'm concentrating on too many things. Let me start over. The way Henry Ford Museum and Greenfield Village define Old Car Festival, which most people refer to as antique cars, you know, a, a show for antique cars, is anything 1932 and earlier. The reason for that is because they consider the development of the first monoblock removable flathead V8, which was the Ford V8, to be the technological change that modernized the automobile. Does that make sense? Did it did it come out clear? So basically, you know the 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 idea of having a you know single cast V block eight cylinder engine was the one of the major turning points in modernizing the automobile as we know it today. So they're going with the V block because we had removable heads prior. Yeah I, yeah, I shouldn't have said removable head. Well, there were V8s that didn't have removable heads. Well, I'm just thinking like but, Packard had straight, they were straight eights, but the heads were yeah, removable. Right. Right. But okay. it was the, the idea of casting a, you know, a single cast block that was a V8, right. had removable heads, was basically your modern day V8 engine. Okay. Um, 
see here. Ah, Robert Isaacs. Okay. Thank you. Um, but is it really, you know, Robert Isaacs was saying, um, you know, Haggerty, anything 79 or older. Um, trying to think here. Uh, but it's obviously varying definitions with, uh, what do I want to say? With whoever. Um, yeah, every, every group's going to define it differently. And, you know, it's just, like I said, they're such ambiguous terms. You know, I mean, go to, go to an antique store and, you know, an antique store and you're going to find stuff from the 1980s and 1990s in there at some of the, the booths that people have set up. Are they, are those antiques? You know, are your, are your coat collectibles from the 1990s uh, antiques? They're in an antique store. Does that make them antique? Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, I just looked up uh, the Classic Car Club of America. And actually, they don't go by age. They basically say, um, since its beginning in 1952, the Classic Car Club of America has been about vintage classics, 1915 through 1948. So they're saying like, a vintage classic is 15 through 48. So there I guess a 49 is not included in that. No, and, it's neither, and, 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 and neither is a 14. Yeah. Well, that's, I, that's because 15, you know, 1915 to 1916 is the transition and end of what everybody refers to as the brass era. So you don't have brass era cars. Although 1915, you still have quite a bit of brass on some cars, but really 1915, 16 is often considered the end of the brass era. And then 17, 16, 17 forward is, uh, you know, nickel era there's you know black iron mentioned in there in some groups but yeah really horseless carriage to brass era to nickel era is the common path that leads up and uh, so they're kind of they're kind of jumping in at that end of the brass era to get that classic definition but the organization was founded in 52 for 15 to 48 vehicles. So say you and I decided to say it didn't exist and we decided right now, let's start the Classic Car Club of America. Mm -hmm. That would be like saying cars from 19, or excuse me, 2018 would be, that's for, you know, they were talking 40 year old cars. That's what we're talking here. Actually, probably 2019 because no. there's 2023s on the market. Yeah, as I say, they were only talking two years, or no, they fifty-two, right? Not fifty-two. 50. So yeah, so yeah, back it up, like two thousand nineteen. Yeah. So I'm only gonna do um, cars that were designed to run on unleaded gas. So cars nineteen seventy four, nineteen seventy five to two thousand eighteen. Those are classic cars to me. Well, are you going to back up and, and do all the earlier stuff too? Because tetraeth tetraethyl lead started uh, getting added to gasoline in about 1926 oh, or 29 that they started playing with it, as I recall. No, uh, because because I'm one of these exclusionaries and th oh, these, okay. are, these are the rules that I set. Gotcha. All right. But those, those are, you know... Frankly, I I'm tired. But wait, if 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 no drive if that's going to be the no driving gloves definition of you're saying that's classic. Yes. Okay, so what did you say? 1970. I think it's four. 74 is pretty much when was it? 74 ish. 
Yeah, I think, and then it stretched out, like lawsuits and stuff stretched out into the late 70s over it. Uh, so if we use my definition of antique, we would have everything pre-1904 right now. And yours would, your classic definition would be everything after 74. So vintage no. must be everything from 1905 to 1973. No, no. 74 to 2018. Otherwise it's too new of a car. That's, so that's right. My definition. Oh, 74 no. to 2019. That's classic. So vintage is everything from 1905 to 1973. We solved it. No, I don't think I like that one. Vintage is... Um... I don't know. Maybe because vintage is just like, it's just like be, wine. Because no, no, no. You're, it's, it's just going to be like wine. When you refer to your car, you just be like, it's, it's a, it's a 1919 vintage. It's, it's got a great, yeah. it's got great rubber. Great. You know, it has very, very oaky undertones. A uh, little bit of, a little bit of ash in there. And uh, you know, a little, little bit of uh, burnt oil aromas. Mm, yes, yes. Really, really picking up the antifreeze kind of sweet smell here out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, in researching and looking over this, it's literally take a handful of crap and throw it at the wall and see what sticks. And there's um you know the one excuse me i'm sorry that taco bell is revisiting me um i never looked up what like webster's defines classic vintage and antique as and then do we do that because antique does have a certain definition in the um collecting world of say art uh fine art or furniture or things like that is that what we're trying to do with cars and do, do we look at what true antiques are and what true vintage is where or do the does that fluctuate does that fluctuate in other hobbies or interests I don't know. I don't play in very many other hobbies and interests. I think it does. I mean, it, again, it goes back to the antique store. Uh, you, you know, the, the, and even I, even if you go into high end antique stores, there's no real limit on what they're going to put in there. They're going to high end antique stores are going to put in, you know, your higher end, valuables right i mean if we think about furniture you know probably let's see it's 2022 so let's say 30 40 years ago mid-century modern pieces weren't really I, okay some of the the artistic very high-end mid-century modern has always been valuable but some of the lower end mid-century modern pieces, they weren't terribly valuable. They weren't that old. But now mid-century modern pieces of furniture are becoming more collectible, more valuable. And I mean, mid-century modern automobiles, I hate to say it, styling cues of automobiles come from the art world. They come from what's going on in society and culture. So we have Art Deco. Automo inspired automobiles. We have Art Nouveau inspired automobiles. We have mid-century modern inspired automobiles. It's all part of that. What's going on. Uh, and so, you know, as time goes by, those pieces are going to change and become more interesting to the collectors. So, yeah, I mean, I think in the, in the antique furniture hobby in, all of those, you know, I mean, you never, I will say this in the, in the art world, I don't think I've ever heard anyone refer to a piece of art as an antique piece of art. It's just simply art. 
right? I mean, I, you've I never think, heard of yes. some, you've never heard somebody say, "Oh, we should we should run down to the uh, the Met this weekend and check out the antique Van Goghs." No, it's just we should go see the Van Gogh exhibit or the Michelangelo exhibit. Not, oh, you know, that antique sculpture that Michelangelo did. But wouldn't you get the antique um, Ming vases? I've heard that before. Or the. Um, but that's not. Antique. That's not. That. It, it is a, a type of art right because they're they're lumped in that but they are decorative arts and they are they tend to be objects that are yeah you know, when they were created really more, were more for i hate to say pedestrian use but you know they were for a purpose of you know putting something in right one of the the vases things like that flowers whatever they were putting in those a piece of art be it a painting a sculpture defining it as let's call it fine art although some deck art falls into fine art it's that's where you don't hear these antique vintage and classic terms I don't know. Maybe I'm going off on a terrible tangent here, but it's all because, and in our discussions in this past week over this topic, John, you know, I sent a text to you saying, oddly, this is very apropos because I'm working on a paper on this in the automotive museum field on nomenclature that we use, why we use it and whether or not it's right. You didn't use apropos, but. You know, okay, Robert. Sorry, I I uh, wanted to elevate the conversation for the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Robert goes on here, and he's kind of saying what I I said. Is it just because a car's old? He says there needs to be some desirability. And I went ahead and answered I my object. question, or did what I, I said. I object, Your Honor. I well. I did what I said. Why, why don't we do this? Why do we have to be unique as car people? And um, the Webster Dictionary definition of antique. And I mean, these actually play really well into the car world, kind of. Now you're going to say kind of. Antique. A noun. A collectible object, such as a piece of furniture or work of art, that has a high value because of considerable age. So they're saying it needs to, in order to be an antique, it needs to be of considerable age and have a high value. So that even kind of eliminates yours with, you know, older than the oldest person living because it still needs to have a high value. Of course, there's very few cars pre-1904 that don't have a high value. Um, then we go into an, the definition of a classic well, wait a second. The definition of antique as a adjective um, having a high value because of considerable age, belonging to ancient times is the second. Statues of a ancient gods or antique gods. Yeah. Um, and then it can also be used as a verb. But classic would go on uh, as an adjective, well, as a noun, a work of art recognized and established value. Um, as an adjective, judged over a period of time to be of the highest quality and outstanding of its kind. That doesn't take the value into it, but it is of the highest quality and outstanding of its kind. Um, I can kind of go with that too. And then if we finally get down to vintage, um, it really, the definitions all focus on wine. So should we even have vintage as cars? What did uh, I say earlier? What yeah, did I say earlier? Exactly. Uh, the definition of vintage in current terms as a noun, the year or place in which wine, especially wine of high quality was produced. 
um, true meaning of vintage from the Merriam-Webster dictionary. Uh, definition one of wine relating to or uh, produced in a particular vintage. Two of old recognized and enduring interest, importance, or quality. I go with that one. If it's vintage, it's got to be old, recognized, it has enduring entrance, interest, importance, or quality. So it doesn't have to have all three, just and I think that I think those definitions really define it. And it's not saying okay, before hang, 19, hang. 1932 or something. But wait, you just said vintage said had the word old in it, right? Yes. So how do you define old? What makes something old? A year, two years, three years, four years, five years? I think it's an interpretation of old. Because not only does it have to be old, it has to be recognized. So that means more than one person has to agree that it's old. And has enduring entrance or importance or quality. So you've got to have those three things. So if it's very important and somebody's recognizing it as important, then those does that same group recognize it as old? That is a interesting question, John. So, yeah, I like these definitions. I can go with that. I can really roll with these. God dang it, the dictionary's smart. That Webster, I mean, come on. We knew everything. I, I heard a trivia question this week about um, dictionaries, and I never did hear the answer, but I'm pretty sure I know the answer, and I guess I have the Google in front of me so I could find it out. But what one word is spelled incorrectly in every dictionary incorrectly that was my assumption uh probably in in every american dictionary no because they probably have both in there i was going to say uh aluminum or properly aluminium Why would that be spelled incorrectly? Well, the the true spelling of it is aluminium with an extra I. But is that incorrect? Because that's not the accepted spelling of it. That's that's why I'm saying <laughs> that I it probably isn't the answer. <laughs> Okay, well, we came up with, I came up with because it's me and it's no driving gloves and I'm a podcaster, so I know everything. We have just now defined classic vintage and antique automobiles. Wait, aren't you going to answer the question of what car, what word is spelled incorrectly in every dictionary? I told you I don't know. I didn't hear the answer. Oh, Lord, that you really did that to us? Yeah. I said, okay, I can I back of, up to my... Can I back up to my objection? I agree with your dictionary terms. I. Well, your dictionary terms, this is interesting. Hmm. Hmm. I have a hard time with the idea of, as Robert put it, cars of interest should only be categorized because who's going to define if it is a car of interest because well i have i mean it's i have i have uh, myself and a few of my friends have interest in cars that other people hate and despise and don't have any interest in well that's where in vintage it's enduring interest and I believe even if people despise it, it still has interest. You know, it's kind of like there's no such thing as bad publicity or 
if they're talking about it, it's good. Doesn't matter if they're talking negatively about it. It's good because it puts you you're on the forefront of thought. Uh, it's kind of like, let's go with Etzel's. Weren't they despised and hated when they were new, et cetera, et cetera? Why do people collect <laughs> them now? Etzel, it's not that they got Baker Avantes. It, uh, it's not that they got all of a sudden became better cars. People remember them, and they're going to spark interest. Mm-hmm. So it, you know, like those those. Oh, and things. John, don't forget for 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 you know your side of the world and and my side of the world in some ways, the Lotus Europa. That car was not very well liked when it first came out. That, you know, what people thought wasn't great styling. Well, you've been talking about, um, or we've talked recently about the uh, Lotus 74 to 76 or so Elite. That wasn't exactly. Yeah, the Elite. Um, and I mean, you get people throw pacers and gremlins and all these Yugo. other things. Robert just threw out the Yugo. Well, see, and, and see, I have an interest in Yugos. I re- really like it. And I just saw a uh, a Yugo convertible for sale again. And there's only, it's, it's really weird. There's only like, what, 40 of them in this country or were imported. And there's usually always one for sale. And hmm. it's always a different one. But see that that would mean just about everything we've discussed there would be vintage. Yeah. Now would they Again, be ambiguous? They, but would, they would not be classic because they are not necessarily to the highest quality. Um and they are not remarkably and in, in Instructively typical. Wait, say that again. Read the whole thing again. What? I can't. That one doesn't make sense. Can you read? No, sometimes I can't. Um, This segment, this segment brought to you by Hooked on Phonics. Judged over a period of time to be of the highest quality and outstanding of its kind. This is classic. So that would eliminate just about the Yugo and the Gremlin and anything we talked about. Um, Or a noun, it would be defined as a work of art, recognized and established value. Well, they have established value, but I think when, and I'm going to interpret that definition to be value, meaning of significant expense, not it's worth 40 bucks. Uh, well, but do they define value? Well, like I said, I it think is, you is it, got, is it monetary value or could we be talking about historic value? So at that point, you're saying that an Etzel could be a classic because mm-hmm. it is a st- it has established historical value. Mm-hmm. Don't ever build a car that looks like that again. Establish historical value. Uh, and then antique, a collectible object such as a piece of furniture or work of art that has a high value because of its considerable age. So antique does get us, it's got to have considerable age. Mm hmm which kind of goes back to the old thing with vintage, but it has to have a high value where vintage doesn't necessarily have to have the high value. This is very interesting. Not where I thought this conversation was going to go this evening. I'm liking it. Yeah. So, I mean, when you're really, I guess, looking at the definitions of these things, We have to, I I think we need to step out of the car world and actually think about it. And all the definitions that were given, you know, everybody always tries to define it by a year. 
that's not what any of these words actually mean in the English language. This is literally, I, <laughs> I'm, it's, I, this is literally exactly what the paper I'm writing is about. <laughs> it's so perfect. It is so perfect. Well, now you've got an audio version. You can exactly. Just... Except for mine goes deeper into many other words. So, well, we only have uh, as much time as we want to take because it's a podcast. Nothing irritates me more than when you're listening to a podcast. And me, well, we've got time for one last question. You've got time for eighty questions if you don't want to get up from your computer and microphone. You know. <laughs> Just got to, yeah, keep... but we also don't want to bore our, our listeners. Well, I was so just gonna say, it, like an hour is that's one thing, it doesn't matter how long your podcast is, as long as you're providing value. So, it's if you only go, so it's, eight... so it's an antique podcast or a vintage podcast, which one was providing value? Um, <laughs> significant value, <laughs> which just throws everything out of the water. Oh, uh, that Robert... would, it would not be antique. It would. Um, Robert's Robert's comment was sometimes old is just old and has no value. He just defined John Viviani. Yeah, you want to see my value? I'll push in the show. <laughs> and then everybody will be sitting out there lost. Yes. So have we have we killed the classic? vintage and antique conversation because i want to bring up one other term that we have used on the show before we gave will a hard time about and i have thought i almost i almost put word. i almost put it in the infographic because i know we have not talked about this but it almost went into the show cover art because i know what word you're talking about what word is it john resto mod resto mod exactly I have no idea. It, well, the paper that I'm writing s kind of spurred my mind into thinking about this word again because of the the wonderful debates we have with Will when he's on about it. But I think I've come up with an idea of what it could define rather than what it currently does define because right now and and will and i and i think you agree that resto mod really as it's being thrown around and used today is simply a new word for a hot rod or a street rod whichever way you want to define hot rod or street rod well because the resto mods are using ls swapped engines and you know, blah, 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 blah. They're, they're hot rodding or street rodding the car. They're basically nearly fully customizing the car and calling it a resto mod. But I think if we were to break that down, that word is restoration modification, right? So it's a modified restoration. I think so if you go I back... Think I think if you go back to the episode that we originally got in that debate, I believe that was the definition that I provided. What? Which one? A modified restoration. Right. But did we, did we clarify what that would mean? No, because Will didn't like it. <laughs> well, right. But I, I think if we didn't get into the discussion of what that means, then it's useless to just say it. Because, you know, I, I, I've just, I just started kind of thinking about this and diving into it. And I really think where that needs to fall is, and, and my mind immediately went to a lot of, here, we'll use the word antique car, uh, early car collectors, you know, brass era, and a nickel era and all those eras, Model T era car collectors that often do tours will add some type of upgraded or modified braking system to their car, even though it is restored exactly as it would have come out of the factory. They restore it all the way to that point, and then they simply add or modify 
a better braking system so that it's safer on the road. Uh, occasionally they'll add sometimes a period overdrive or sometimes a not period overdrive to the car. I guess to me that resto mod should be applied to cars that are, let's call it nearly you know, restored to factory specifications, but have what I would call very minor modifications for let's call it safety or, you know, comfort, uh, you know, adding vintage air to your collector car and, you know, uh, instead of a manual transmission, having a automatic transmission put in it to make it easier to drive. I think that's kind of where that resto mod term needs to be used. That's that's just kind of what I'm brainstorming right now. Now, see, I still agree with kind of how the resto mod term is used. The actual definition is, or one of the definitions, and it's kind of the one I go with. It is a classic car that has been restored, but modified using modern parts and technology. Aesthetically, the vehicle looks the same until you look under the hood or reach for the radio or, you know, it has power seats or it has. No, a it doesn't because half the half the resto mods running through Barrett Jackson have a candy pearl clear coat on them and aluminum 18 inch rims. They look nothing like factory. No, they, they, that again, that's modified with modern parts and technology. You're putting modern wheels on it. You're putting modern tires. Then you haven't restored the car. No. If you're restoring and the car, it uses that, 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 parts. That's where both you and Will get stuck. They never say restoring it original. They're saying a car that has been restored but modified. And so what's I understand, and I understand. There's where Will kind of said is that it's not restored; it's modified at that point. Yeah, you're. I think it's paying homage or respect to the original styling of the vehicle, but bringing it to a comfort level that will encourage use. I think that definition allows for too much modification if you're going to use the restoration term ahead of it. That's my take on it. Well, that gets us into then, and now we're getting into more terms and we're probably going to have to uh, carry it on to another show. What does restoration mean? What is a restored car? Exactly. So, uh, what, did what you is say? an over restored? What, what did you say I was there, Derek? Was I classic vintage or antique? Uh, no, I said you're uh, just old. Sometimes old is just old and has no value. Okay, well, that, and then you just answered Robert's question there, too. All of our listeners you, have you, value, John. It's the hosts that have you, no value. You young whippersnapper, you. Yeah. Hey, I'm, whatever. I don't care. Well. I'm not in my 40s yet. I think for once, no driving gloves might have actually answered the question that was the topic. Look up the Indeed. damn word in the dic dictionary, and that's the way we go. It doesn't matter if it's applying to a car, a vase, a table, a chair. A, I think I already said a vase, but I mean, doesn't matter what it's applying to. Look up the modifier. It is a vintage car. It is a vintage plant. It is a vintage chair. It is an antique, you know, car. It is an antique set of silverware. It is an antique goblet. You know, just, it's all the same. Just look up what the damn, at this point we're using it as an adjective. Um, it is an antique bedpan. 
I so to, seen, to, so yeah, exactly. my dad has an so, antique uh, oxygen concentrator. Or something. There you go. So seeing we answered the question, maybe kind of, we can steal a line from another show. And we can end on that bombshell. I think that there you was go. the line from the other show. That's what I'm I, saying. And I can't we'll remember steal which. Jeremy Clarkson, Top Gear. And oh, on that's that bombshell. I can't, I can't see. And I can't go with that because... Um, I despise Jeremy Clarkson. I think he's the worst stain on most the automotive. people do. Yeah. He's the worst stain on the automotive hobby ever and should be totally eliminated. And I can't stand what? And I'm say I can't stand the arrogant son of a bitch. And well, yeah, that's <laughs> uh, everybody. Everybody feels that way. Right. But here's the interesting thing. I want to go back and watch top gear from the very beginning all the way up to the bombshell of an ending of the show with those hosts on it so you because want to start I, I watching, saw want to start well, watching i saw top gear clip. from 1978 yeah why not but specifically when jeremy clarkson comes on to the show because i saw a clip not that long ago probably right around the time he started and he was actually giving a review of a car that was actually relevant and more of your, uh, you know, actual automotive review type discussion about, you know, space in the car and, you know, level of road noise versus, you know, versus another car. And, and it, it was actually useful information uh, at the time. I don't know when the clip was from, I just happened to see it. I don't even remember where, but it would be interesting to see the progression and when, well, I mean, it's like so even you, in America, you... I mean, it's a, it, at some point during the, I'm going to call it the 90 late nineties, probably early two thousands. Everything that was educational had to change. It had to become entertainment and entertainment only because that seems to be all people want anymore. They don't really care about information. It's just what's entertaining. Let's drop a car from a helicopter and see what it does. It's so, it's useless, and it, it's the same thing as the History Channel. The History you Channel watch was the good, pro- now it sucks. Well, it doesn't have anything to do with history. Uh, but you want to watch Top Gear from when Jeremy Clarkson joined the show to the day he ended. Because Top Gear goes back decades and decades. Well, I know, I know. But I, know, I wouldn't mind starting it from the beginning, just to, because they're going to be reviewing interesting vehicles that have, you know, information that would be good for an automotive historian. I am. I still very rarely will I not hedge. And I always have to be a little bit vague about something. Jeremy Clarkson. Nope. From the moment he was fired uh, from Top Gear, I have not watched in a single episode of any sort of Top Gear, whatever the damn Netflix show he did, and I lost all respect for uh, James May and the little midget dude. Um, I used to like them a lot more than Jeremy on Top Gear. Lost all respect for him because they didn't stand by the little guy. They stood by the, their, their own pocketbook. So those three guys... I don't care how big they are to the automotive world. Dude, you know, I just, so I can't let you end on a bombshell. I, I don't really <laughs> think anybody's going to disagree with you, John. Eh, there might be a few, but you, I don't, you think don't think anybody's going to disagree with me. That's why they had what? 
eight seasons, nine seasons on Netflix afterwards. You know, yeah, they, they have a ton okay, of fans. Anybody, anybody that is knowledgeable in the automotive world and automotive history, uh, is that better? Do no, I need to I clarify? Just, I, I, I disagree. I think there's too many people that just... So we won't end on a bombshell, but um, we could end on the prisoner with his Lotus 7 and be seeing you. There you go. I'm out of here. See you guys.